Kia ora and welcome to the um, webinar on the amazing piece of research that Derek Wenmuth and Professor Michael Barber have undertaken, which looks into distance learning in New Zealand. And this is the second of two part discussion, um, being a live Q&A for everyone. Tēnā koutou koutoua, ko Jane Treadwell hoi ahau. I'm Jane and I'm the Executive Director of the Education Partnership in Education, Education Partnership and Innovation Trust. And it's lovely to have everybody with us today. We're going to um, kick off with a karakia and then we'll get into the agenda. Ki hora te marino, ki whakapapa paunamu te moana, he hura hi matato i te rangi nei. Araha atu, araha mai, tato i a tato katoa, huie taikie. Yeah. Welcome everyone. Uh, we encourage you to, to let us know where you are today. So please feel free to use the chat and tell us where about the motu you're coming from. I'm based here in Onahanga in Tamaki Makaro, and the skies have just gone very dark and it's raining again. Uh, so situation normal for us. I'm looking forward to this Q&A and we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A, please. Um, and if you want to um, ask questions, we are having this moderated, so uh, Nish, our Community Engagement Manager, will look after that. Oh, first of all, what I'm going to do is let Derek and Michael introduce themselves, and then we'll start. They're going to give us an overview of what the research is and what they've been doing, and then we'll open up for questions. So Michael, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks. Thank you much, Jane, and I apologize for uh, I was bantering with Derek just as Jane was entering the opening up the room. So I apologize to our attendees for that, and I suspect it was uh, on the recording as well. Uh, so I'm Michael Barber. Uh, I'm a professor of instructional design and director of faculty development in the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University, of California in lovely Vallejo. Um, we were hoping for rain today because we always like rain in California. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the skies have started to open up and the sun has come out, which uh, for us is, is a real detrimental thing. But I'll turn it over to you, Derek, for the introductions. And it's been my pleasure to re be working with Michael on this. It's been a, a long term journey that he and I have had for many, many years now. So having this report come out on um, my background is in education in New Zealand in a whole range of areas, um, more most recently as one of the co-directors of core education, but stepped back from that about five years ago and now run my own consultancy called Future Makers. Jane, awesome. Yes. Thanks both. Michael, if you wouldn't mind um, kicking off and we can then um, outline what you've been working on and we'll ask and we'll open up the Q&A. All right. Sounds good. So uh, as I was bantering with Derek on the way in, um, this is, uh, I guess, the fourth webinar that we've had on this, the second one that EPIT has hosted. So if you've been to some of the other webinars, uh, some of this you've probably already seen a little bit. So I'm going to try to go through it quickly so we can get into the conversation part of the uh, agenda. Um, so at the first, I, I want to thank those folks that have provided uh, support to this research. Uh, my own university provided a grant. Uh, EPIT provided a, a, an ability for us to actually extend the work, which is uh, currently uh, ongoing. And I noticed some folks in the room are actually uh, in the process of collecting data for us on that. Um, obviously, Derek's Future Makers has been uh, uh, provided a, a number of in-kind contributions. And uh, the Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand are the project website hosts. So they provided a lot of in-kind work on that. Um, so if you haven't looked at it already, the uh, website is available at that link. And uh, as soon as I'm done, I'll drop it in the chat. Although while I'm going, Derek can drop it in the chat as well. Um, to give you a sense of, of the project, really, there's sort of three pieces to what we had intended to do. Uh, the first was to look at the, the nature of governance and the extent of, of activity when it came to distance learning in the school sector, specifically for the most recent school year, the 2023 school year. Uh, the secondary project that we were looking at, or secondary aspect of the project, was we were exploring with those stakeholders that we were engaging with, 
what they viewed as the ideal future um, education system. You know, what would that look like? What would it comprise? And then, um, thanks to the the, the generous uh, contributions by uh, EPIT, we were able to actually extend the work, and that's what's happening right now. Um, looking at that first aspect, but extending it to the previous five school years. So once we're finished with that data collection, we'll have the ability to look at um, how things have changed pre-COVID, during COVID, and now sort of in the post-COVID period. Uh, and the initial data that we've gotten, and we've probably gotten about two-thirds of it in at this stage, um, has been quite interesting to see how that um, evolution has happened and the impact that COVID has had upon it. Um, so one of the other things that we kind of did along the way, uh, we did the first version of this in the report, um, and we've got a more detailed version of it that was published in the Journal of Flexible and Distance Learning uh, by Flans, uh, was look at a history of uh, distance learning within the school sector, uh, tracing it over the last little bit better than a half or a little bit better than a full century uh, from the establishment of the correspondence school right up to uh, and including the impact that that COVID had on the system and what might happen next. Um, so looking specifically at that first one, um, we were really looking at three research questions, uh, how they were governed, how they were resourced, and then how much was actually happening was essentially what it boiled down to. Uh, we surveyed all of the providers that we could find, and we used that term provider very specifically. It was actually a term used uh, by the ministry when they uh, last tried to do something around distance learning regulation. Uh, we did follow-up interviews with many of the stakeholders, plus a lot of document analysis of things that were uh, publicly available from these individual providers as well as from um, public sources. In terms of sort of looking at how these things were regulated, we decided to come up with this sort of structure where we had programs or providers divided into schools and programs. Schools were ones that were mentioned specifically in the Education Act. Programs were ones that sat outside of it. And as you can see in both cases, the both versions, regardless of it's school or program, come in sort of the public or private versions. In the case of programs, that would be nonprofit and for-profit. And as you can see, the public entities can get further divided down a little bit more. Um, when we looked at how these programs were governed, there was uh, a number of different ones and they sort of fell into different categories. So in the case of the distance and special schools, um, they were mainly out of the Education Act as well as the Gazette uh, and as well with the one distance school that's there, Takura. Uh, they were uh, also governed by an collective agreement that was separate than the collective agreement that we find in the brick and mortar environments. Uh, with almost all of the programs, they were governed through some form of trust. Uh, most of them were set up as at least the uh, nonprofit ones uh, were set up as um, nonprofit trusts. So they had um, the governance documents around that. Um, in case you're wondering who all of these folks were, uh, the ones that we've been able to identify, and this slide is updated a little bit, uh, only because since we published the report, uh, and we've been getting some uh, publicity around this. We've actually been able to identify at least one additional nonprofit distance learning program, and they're being incorporated into the report right now. Uh, we've got their data. <clears throat> We're just uh, making sure we've got the, the profile for them uh, accurate before we post it online. Um, so as you're looking at the, the different types of activity from uh, these individual programs, um, what we were able to indicate in the report, and we've excluded the mine uh, plus online from this one because we haven't finalized that one yet. Uh, you can see that uh, when it comes to the supplemental uh, programs that are out there, there were about 13 and a half thousand students that were engaged in this in, in one way, shape or form. Uh, when it comes to full time students, uh, there were be just over 22,000 that are there. Uh, you can see there's a lot of tildes uh, and, and asterisks there uh, to indicate that, you know, these things are, are fluid in their nature. And even with the full-time numbers, you can see that we've got a range in there as opposed to an exact number. Um, if you're wondering how this breaks down by uh, sort of sector, uh, you can see that uh, the sector that's probably the, the smallest group um, would be the home-based education students, although 
a lot of it depends upon how you define distance learning in that environment. Uh, both of us suspect that that number is actually much higher. They just mm -hmm. don't necessarily, uh, they don't see themselves as distance education entities or distance education providers, even though they in most cases are. Uh, so if you exclude that number, um, primary comes in at the lowest, which you would kind of expect um, both because, you know, the correspondence school is the biggest player and they primarily focus upon the secondary environment. Um, the secondary numbers, I think, are actually quite impressive uh, when you look at it, it's approaching 10 percent, which uh, if we were to compare it to North American numbers is basically where we see some of the highest levels of, of activity in North America would be in that 10 to 12 percent. Uh, so at 9.1 percent, that's actually right in the ballpark of what we would see in, in those programs that are, are much more established and in many cases driven by um, for-profit corporations. Uh, overall, you've got about four and a half percent of the students uh, that are engaged in this in some way. Um, in terms of, of the key takeaways, because, you know, there's a lot of um, variability in what we're reporting on this front. Um, we can say that there's about 4% of students that are, are engaged in, in school sector distance learning, um, although that could vary significantly based on uh, level of student and type of school. Um, we're probably safe in guessing that there's about 1% of primary and that it's about 10% of secondary students that have been engaged in this in the past school year uh, in one way, shape, or form. And I, I wanted to get through that quickly because, um, A, it's been the focus of two other um, webinars that we've done, which you can get the recordings for on the website. Plus, that's sort of what the, the, the meat of the report uh, focuses upon as well. Uh, the second aspect of, of our study, this is the one that we're just finishing right now and that we've just started presenting uh, on this material, was looking at sort of what a future system might look like. And as we interviewed all of those stakeholders, we, we came up with these four uh, statements that we thought an ideal educational ecosystem would have. Um, and basically, we're looking there was a lot of agreement around these four and it was actually quite interesting that as we started looking at the interviews it wasn't that different individuals or different groups of individuals say those who were directly providing distance learning as opposed to those who were supporting it as you know some sort of educational institution um, you know said one or two of them uh, in most cases, as we looked at the interview transcripts, uh, the vast majority of people touched on at least three of these four areas. So it was very clear as, as we were going through the, the data that these were sort of the four that we were looking at. Um, so essentially, the ideal ecosystem uh, allows for student agency and choice. Um, it allows for the education that's being provided to be both equitable and inclusive. Um, that the education system itself is cohesive and coordinated so that there's a real partnership between all of the different entities that are in here. Um, and finally, and, and I think this uh, we've seen coming out of COVID in particular, that uh, the system needs to be innovative, both in terms of um, addressing those times when we come into uh, challenges, either man-made or otherwise, um, and, uh, you know, just for the regular times as well. And we'll spend some time unpacking this in the q and I'm sure, uh, but this is sort of where we want to, uh, I think, focus a lot of our conversation is in this future side, uh, because we haven't had a chance to really talk a lot about this. Um, in terms of looking at um, some of the challenges to getting to that ideal e educational ecosystem or some of the areas uh, that needed to be addressed uh, in order for that to happen. Um, within the groups that we were talking with, so within the data that we had from those interviews, there were five that really, you know, stood out to us, or five areas, I should say, that really stood out to us. Um, and I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail here. Um, when it comes to leadership and policy, um, we really needed to make sure that there was the ability to um, engage in honest partnerships across 
different types of learning providers and that we needed to make sure that those people leading those organizations um, were able to enter into those. Uh, the term authentic relationships uh, came up several times um, in order to make sure that there was trust between, you know, the policymakers, those providing the learning opportunities and the parents and students who were on the receiving end of those opportunities and that, you know, one group wasn't trying to, um, you know, well, for to be colloquial, but get one over on the other group or take advantage of the other group. Uh, from a regulatory and funding perspective, um, we needed a, a system that was uh, cohesive and coordinated so that essentially the organization or the entity or the, 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 the provider that was actually delivering the learning in whatever format that was happening um, were the ones that were actually getting the funding for it, or at least getting funding at a level that was um, that would address the level of commitment that they were putting in to the learning that was being provided. Um, with respect to uh, infrastructure and systems, um, and this is, I think, one of the, the biggest areas of, of deficiency that we have in the New Zealand system, um, we needed systems that talked to each other and that allowed for data to be transferred across systems so that regardless of where a student was located or from whom they were receiving their learning, that they were able to access all of the resources that they needed for that and that we could coordinate how that student was being taken care of so that you would have the ability for students to be able to get learning from multiple institutions and not have to rely upon the goodwill of those institutions to data share across the board, that there was some sort of centralized system that would allow for that. Um, with respect to teacher roles, it was made very clear that um, both by those who were involved directly with distance learning, but also those who weren't, that the um, the, the knowledge, the skills, and the aptitudes to be good at delivering education when the uh, learner and the teacher are either geographically or temporally distant from each other were different than it was in an in-person environment. And our teacher education programs really haven't done a good job at preparing folks to you know, teach in those sort of innovative environments. Uh, so there needed to be wholesale changes to how teacher education was done, as well as significant professional development to address those who were currently in the system. Um, and then finally, uh, when it came to accreditation, um, this idea of some of the providers of education being considered official and some not being official or not part of the system or working outside of the system uh, really set up competition between different uh, providers of learning. So we needed to come up with some way, some sort of, uh, well, systematic change, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, to allow for all of these to be considered accredited um, providers of, uh, you know, education or learning opportunities. And that way that they could work in a more cooperative as opposed to a more uh, uh, competitive kind of environment. Uh, we've started to write some of this up. So we do have, uh, Derek presented it at the recent FLANS conference, and we have a document submitted into their proceedings. So as soon as that's released, uh, we have some of this that we'll be discussing. Uh, mainly, actually, these five challenges are where we dove into on the FLANS proceedings. We're also working on a submission, uh, hopefully by the end of the month, early next month, to the Journal of Flexible and Distance Learning, uh, which will focus mainly upon the four principles that we saw in the ideal ecosystem. Um, just to, to finish up in terms of what we've got left, um, finishing up on this one, uh, one of the things you'll notice that, and I only mentioned it in the last one, where it said those who were directly involved in distance learning uh, talked about the, the accreditation. Um, the reality is, is all of the stakeholders that we were talking to here uh, had some, uh, they were either directly or indirectly involved with distance learning at the school sector. And not to say that that, 
means that their perspectives or, or opinions or perceptions were incorrect. But in many cases, there were um, they were presented with a vested interest, let's say. Um, and in many cases, they were presented in a way that uh, would benefit their individual programs or their individual um, organizations that they were representing uh, more so than the larger system. So one of the things that Derek and I are looking to do is to essentially um, take the four areas that we've got, as well as using some of the data that came out of the challenges and come up with, you know, what are some steps that the government has the ability to and wouldn't take that much political will to be able to implement today? And then what are sort of the, the longer systematic things that while we'd like to see them start today might take five or eight or 10 years before we could materialize them. So sort of a two-step process to be able to achieve these four areas. Uh, the other thing that, that we're working on is obviously that last bit. As I mentioned, we've got about two thirds of the providers uh, have already submitted their data for this. Um, and uh, so once we get the last third, we'll be adding that back up to the website. So we'll uh, basically uh, add in more information on each of the individual profiles that are there. Uh, we'll also be producing a report that we'll publish on the website, uh, on the project website, that will go through and essentially outline all of the sort of trends that we see over that five year period. Um, the other thing that we haven't started yet, but it's something that has come up a little bit. One of the things that we noted as we were going through the report and collecting the data was that as we looked at the different types of programs, we saw really three different instructional models that came about. Um, and in many cases, the instructional models were specific to certain types of programs. Uh, so uh, in the case of, say, the health schools and, and the distance learning uh, program or the distance school, um, Takura, they primarily used an asynchronous model. Most of the nonprofit programs, uh, as well as um, um, the deaf education program or the deaf education school, sorry, uh, used a primarily asynchronous model. Most of the private programs, or most of the private schools, I should say, used an independent learning model. Uh, so because those three different models correlated quite well with types of programs, um, over the coming year or two, that's an area that we're hoping to explore a little bit more. Uh, right now, it's just a trend that we've noticed. Uh, but it is something that is, is worth looking into. And, and as we start to look into it, also look at sort of what might be some of the promising practices from each of these three models that we could, um, you know, look to promote uh, examples of, you know, here's someone that is, you know, using asynchronous instruction quite well so that we can encourage other programs to maybe adopt some more of those practices. Um, so again, all of this, uh, including all of the presentations and publications that we've done to date, are available on uh, the website. And um, uh, before I open it up to sort of general questions, I want to give Derek a chance to sort of add in anything. But I think both of us are really looking forward to engaging in the conversation that comes next. Thanks, Michael. I did have a couple of quick things. If you can go back to slide 16. Um, just uh, something to point out as we've been processing is those first two on the list there uh, about student agency and choice equitable and inclusive are things that we hear a lot in education uh, circles around the globe at the moment that as being uh, important and of course in terms of distance education those two things have been for a long time key drivers in the whole development of distance education that we want to be able to make sure that we reach people who perhaps otherwise are excluded from school or don't have the opportunity to participate in the way that others do. And central to that is the um, is the idea of agency and choice, which has become. The, it's number three and four that I find really interesting in the way that they overlap. The cohesive and coordinated uh, really highlights some of the issues that are on the following slides that Michael took you through. Um, which to me, uh, looking at the data that came back from the interviews, there were two things that are resonating as I've been working on it through more recently. One is the whole idea of sustainability 
there are there are lots of things that have been happening uh, and and providers that have sort of started to venture and some that we started with on this project no longer providing as Michael mentioned and that whole idea of sustainability sheets back to some of the things that he was raising about not having an adequate uh, legislative or, or policy framework that that provides the the foundation for those things to go uh, as well as the other key thing is not necessarily um, having a, a strong pedagogical driver that's informed by the sorts of things that Michael was saying. So the, it, it, there's a lot of opportunism that's sort of springing up around the edge. The second thing with sustainability, of course, is systems that a number of the smaller providers that were sort of tinkering around the edge didn't necessarily have a system view of what they were doing or a view that they were contributing to a system. It was an opportunity that they were forging out that they saw uh, existed and so were pursuing. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that per se, but that's why we've deliberately titled this part about you know, the ideal educational ecosystem, because ultimately we need to be able to see how these things will knit together. And as Michael pointed out on one of the slides, you know, to reduce that sense of competing for the same space and actually seeing people drive together. Uh, so that's where I think um, the idea of the promising practices that Michael referred to becomes really, really uh, important. And lastly, which was probably may provoke some of the discussion, it wasn't really on our radar when we started this, but it seems to me that this report is becoming increasingly important right now in the New Zealand education system, as highlighted by two things that are in the news at the moment. There was the, the announcement from Hagley College recently about their hybrid learning pilot, which was such a, I think, a, a wonderful thing for them to do. May or may not be technically hybrid, who knows, but it it's a, it's, meets a lot of these sorts of things. But for 20 students, it certainly raised a lot of media coverage and feedback with people starting to question those same uh, issues of the foundational. Like, can you actually learn at a distance? Won't you go off and misbehave? All that sort of stuff. And I think we'll see more and more of that starting to emerge. And those issues are going to need to be addressed. So those promising practices can become important. The other one, of course, which we haven't yet seen uh, emerge is what's happening with the charter schools. Uh, those the decisions about um, the the people who have applied to become charter schools and there's a very large number um, are underway right at the moment. In fact, this coming week, I believe they will be announced. It'll be uh, not. It won't surprise me at all if at least some uh, of those are choosing to be what we would call distance schools in some way, shape or form and choose to be delivering their programs in this way. So um, those things, I think, make this really, really worthwhile. It's great to have people on the discussion today to start unpacking some of these questions. I see some of those things already popping up. So I'll finish there, Michael, and turn it back for the questions and answers. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think it's really important the work that you've identified, especially around what the ideal educational ecosystem looks like and those four key pillars or PO of success. Um, we have one question in already and I'll just quickly read it. Um, working as a learning designer in a polytech organization that implemented a high flex delivery model which offers flexible learning through asynchronous, synchronous and face-to-face -face options simultaneously. As APRO node transition into tertiary ed, online distance learning becomes more common. Did you look at specific support systems that parents or Akonga might need to adapt to this learning style? I can start there. Um, I mean, to directly answer your question, we didn't specifically design, you know, design anything that would have captured data around that. Um, as we looked at the different programs and, and looked at how they support, how they delivered and how they supported their learning, uh, we did see examples of individual programs and schools that were um, implementing various practices around them. Now, we didn't look at whether or not those practices were being successful or not, um, but so it was data that was sort of captured in a tangential way, uh, but not something that we aim to do specifically. 
Um, I mean, some of the things that that we did find um, in terms of things that were actually happening, and again, no comment on whether or not they're being done well or whether or not they're actually having the desired effect. Um, a, a number of, of, of providers were doing things like uh, having um, open sessions for the parents. Uh, many of them have documents um, as well as initial orientations uh, that outline sort of what is expected of a parent um, to help support a student in this kind of environment, uh, which is something that uh, if you contrast that with what a lot of the schools did during COVID was something that was obviously missing there because, um, you know, many parents uh, you know, we all went to school at some point. So we've got this idea of, of, you know, when our kid is in school, here's the kinds of things we should be doing to help them along. Uh, most of us, at least when we were K-12 students, didn't have an online learning or distance learning experience. Uh, so we don't have that schema of, the, of what we would hope, um, you know, uh, our, our parents would have done for us back then. Um, so we've seen a number of, of providers that have tried to do uh, some of that. Um, the only other thing that I can say that we, we've seen, uh, I have seen a, a couple, um, not so much in the New Zealand context, but particularly in North America, uh, that actually provide training sessions on how to use some of the tools that are available. Uh, in the system, so that way uh, the parent is able to act as at least a, a sort of a level one tech support, if you will. Thanks, Michael. Just thinking through the tech side of this and technology as an enabler for distance learning to occur, um, it's also a barrier and an equity challenge across the country. Did any of that turn up in your research? Um, a little bit, but also, uh, again, in kind of an indirect way, because, uh, I mean, the interviews that we conducted were either with folks that were providing distance learning in some way, shape or form, or organizations that were supporting distance and hybrid learning, um, or, you know, putting in place systems that allowed for. It. Uh, so folks, say, from the ministry or Network for Learning or, um, you know, uh, yeah, those would, I think, be the two big ones uh, that, that we looked at. Um, so they were sort of, those folks were already in the mindset of the fact that, you know, this is something that, that folks should be able to, to, to access. And in many cases, uh, we're actively putting in place things that would overcome some of those technical issues. Um, you know, if you look at, say, a provider of, of, of distance learning, uh, with the exception of many of the privates, most of them have been doing it for uh, well over a decade, actually most of them well over two decades, to be honest with you. So they've been looking at this issue of, of how we can use technology as an enabler for a long time um, and how we can overcome some of the challenges uh, that, um, you know, that, that we have in place with that. Um, so I think our, our, from our data specifically, I think our sample is skewed. Uh, I think Derek, just through his work that he's been doing with Future Makers, probably has a lot more uh, specific things because where he works a lot more with uh, brick and mortar schools that are looking to take advantage of some of the tools and technologies that these distance providers just use as a matter of course. Uh, so I'll let you jump in here, Derek, because I think you can probably provide a better response based upon your experiences. If I can pick up, thanks, Mike. The, the, I'll answer that one, and I'd love to pick up Rachel's question in a second too. Um, but just on that, uh, as Michael noted, I've thrown in there a report that I wrote at the time of COVID that was done for the Ministry of Education. I've added to it there. Um, but you'll find in that report that whole idea of taking of how students are catered for or supported in the home environment became quite an issue. Uh, for, for a handful, it was quite a positive thing in the terms of the feedback from parents and um, because it gave them insights into what was happening in school for their students that they hadn't otherwise had. And that was a positive thing. But for many, many others, it was a negative thing because the, the teachers who were 
doing this were, were making massive assumptions that they just hadn't had the time to sit down and think uh, as, a, as a learning designer might do in, in the traditional sense. Um, but can I shift to Rachel's question? She raised there, um, what do we mean about the statement on innovation? Because this is something that emerged and Michael and I had some really intense discussions about this in an exciting way, I guess, as it came through. And I guess uh, if I, in a summary form, the reason that this is like one of the PO, one of the important things for anything moving forward is that as with anything, there's a real danger that uh, what, what emerges in the distance paradigm becomes just a, a repeat of what's happened in the past or an attempt to replicate what we've known in the past in a non-distance field. And we're seeing this uh, sort of starting to happen, and Michael can speak it to it even more on the global scene, with a number of the very commercially driven providers who are still designing what they're doing based on the delivery of content. It's just simply an, a, a transmissional kind of model that underpins it whether it's synchronous or asynchronous or or independent learning that that you know those three models that is still evident across that so to to address i guess rachel your question key areas that i would be thinking about in terms of innovation at a system level um there are all of the issues that we're up against at the moment that we need the innovative thinking and so forth around the exchange of data uh, and the ability for students to be recognised in the system uh, in mul as being addressed, having needs addressed by multiple providers, for example. That's not a new thought. It's been around for a while, but we really do need the innovation that's going to allow that to become a reality. Another area is um, we constantly hear things about dropout rates in distance education as if it's distance education that's at fault. And without... Uh, wanting to make an argument about without uh, some students, many of us as learners, that's not necessarily a prime way. But another reason that a lot of people drop out of distance programs in the same way as they disengage face to face is that their their interest isn't sustained. They're in it for a while and they have their needs met or something meets it. But then to have to complete the entire program to get the qualification at the end isn't necessarily what motivates them. And so um, the whole area of finding different forms of um, of credentialing what is happening is is a key focus there. And so one of the innovations could be around, you know, new forms of credentialing, micro credentials, that sort of thing that actually allow students to get recognition for the bits of learning along the way and for those things to be stacked and to, again, carry through um, with other innovations like portfolios that follow them through their different layers of schooling. That's just picking off a few of the areas that are not necessarily new in the thinking for many of us who have been in that area for a while, but actually um, require uh, an innovative mindset in order to be determined about making it happen. Otherwise, we, we're simply going to see more of the same uh, continue. Thanks, Derek. And as a follow-up, Rachel actually, just asked, sorry, Michael, do you want to build on that? Yeah, I wanted to jump in on, on, on Rachel's question as well, because uh, uh, and to actually provide a really specific example of, of one of the things Derek was talking about in terms of, you know, the innovative systems that are required, um, you know, during COVID, you know, the the correspondent school, Takura, you know, had all of this asynchronous learning content that they were willing to provide to schools to be able to use so that teachers didn't have to go in and essentially recreate online content uh, themselves, particularly given the fact that the vast majority aren't trained. The hurdles that they faced in trying to give students direct access to that content I mean, as I've unpacked it, not just with the correspondence school, but with the Ministry of Education, with some of the individual schools that were trying to um, actually access the material themselves, um, as well as other partners that were trying to help facilitate all of this. It, it was just mind boggling how difficult it was simply because the the system wasn't in place 
to allow for a, a common way to read each student, a common identification for each student that could just be shared across systems. Uh, the other area about innovation that, that Derek didn't quite mention, but I think is an important one, is, is this idea of uh, expanding who we consider a provider of learning. You know, yeah. for us right now, we think about schools, we think about, um, you know, tertiary environment, we think about these programs that we've set up here now. But, you know, there's no reason why we can't have a lot of, you know, these work study environments that students are going out into where they are picking up, you know, not just real world skills, but in many cases, skills and, and knowledge that are listed as part of the formal curriculum but we can't offer them credit in any kind of way because, you know, the, the auto shop isn't considered a provider of learning. Um, you know, so looking at how we can be innovative in terms of who's providing the education and, and, and how we measure the learning that's happening there and taking into account those types of things. Um, and I see Derek wants to answer Rachel's follow-up question uh, as he's indicated in the Q&A, so I'll stop there. Uh I uh, probably would say exactly what you did, uh, would, Michael. Uh, in answer to Rachel, we didn't specifically measure uh, attrition and participation in this particular study. But I think what this study does is highlighting a range of areas that need to be picked up in future uh, studies to get some deeper understandings uh, on this. It's an interesting one, Michael, because <clears throat> if you think about a four-year law degree, the fifth year is experiential learning within a framework but each individual law firm is not actually accredited per se. It's the framework that's accredited and you learn on the job, which is exactly what would happen if a student was working in an auto shop. Um, and, sorry, Jane, if I can just add to, to add one more illustration, I think the correspondence school, Takura, for example, uh, are um, they use the big picture format for a range of the things that they do. Uh, in their schools uh, and with their students. And of course, the big picture approach is very much about an experiential um, opportunity, learning opportunity for students out there. And they've developed quite comprehensive systems for having advisors and people who monitor and mentor what's happening for students who are out in those areas. So we do have insights and, and opportunities to build from here in New Zealand. One of the questions that's come up privately in the chat to me is, with the chronic teacher shortage we're seeing across the country, how does this tie into the teacher skill set? And also, is there potential for this to deliver um, solutions to our more rural and more re remote schools who are struggling to get teachers? And what does the teacher population um, need to do to embrace this distance education? I, I guess the short answer to the question is yes. <laughs> Um, you know, this could be, um, this could have great potential in so many ways. And we see isolated examples of this happening already. In fact, I, I would argue that if you look at um, both the, the Kotuiako and Net and Z, I think they are excellent illustrations of this in action, not just in terms of the ability to provide uh, students in rural and remote areas with teachers that are trained in specific areas, but also the ability to allow some of those teachers who are trained in specific areas that may not want to, you know, work in a brick and mortar environment, you know, from nine to, to, to three or eight to two or whatever the, you know, the, the school hours are on a full time basis. It allows them to, you know, come back into the classroom. They might be a retired teacher. They might be, uh, you know, a teacher that, you know, for health reasons, doesn't want that full-time position, doesn't even want like a half-time position, to be able to come in and teach a single class and for that class to be shared across this geographic area um, so that, you know, they're not bound to just whomever can show up to that one school that, you know, within that roughly 80 kilometer range that they would pick up, you know, from the buses from. 
Um, you know, so I, I think that we have that great potential and, and, you know, I, I'm sure uh, I see Ken and, and Rachel in, in, in the room here. I'm sure they could both provide specific examples of individual teachers they have right now that are doing that exact thing. Um, you know, and, and the correspondence school is another example of, of how we're seeing, you know, the ability to share those resources across vast geographic uh, distances. Um, you know, in, in terms of one of the, I think, shortcomings that we see from a systematic perspective is I think there are more teachers out there that would be interested in doing this, but unless they happen to be at a brick and mortar school that were participating in one of these programs in the past, many of them don't know that these online programs exist. Uh, many of them don't know how to take it, you know, how to, to become engaged with them or as they retire and they think to themselves, you know, I wouldn't mind teaching a class, you know, once a term uh, or every other term. They wouldn't even think to reach out to these programs uh, because they haven't had that experience with them. Um, and unfortunately, our teacher education programs really don't provide them with, you know, a good skill set to be able to do a lot of that. So even if they were really great teachers in the classroom, um, you know, the idea that I could teach one class online every term to do this doesn't it doesn't enter their mindset because they don't see themselves as having that ability because they've never done those kinds of things. And they've never been trained in that area. Um, you know, but it is something that I think has great potential. It, for me, it's one of, I think, the main success stories of those nonprofit programs that are out there right now, because I think this is sort of one of the, the things I, if I were a marketing person and I were looking to promote these programs, that's one of the ways in which I would sort of be holding them up to say, like, we need more of this because of this very aspect. Uh, yeah, if I can just add to that, I think Michael's enthusiasm mirrors mine for this. I think it's one of the the, the hidden um, benefits of what we're talking about. But it does highlight, though, the, the in terms of the barriers that we were talking about before, the, the issue around our, our legislative and, and policy frameworks, um, as we have just seen in New Zealand in the last two days with the announcement by the government to allow non-registered teachers or people coming back into the profession um, to, to teach in schools as part of a, a way of addressing the teacher shortage, the, the concerns and issues that are just flooding in through all sorts of channels at the moment uh, are very much the same as sit in behind the sorts of things that um, Michael's been saying. So there, there needs to be some really solid thought given to how we activate this right through to, as Michael said, how, how do we make sure these people are, um, have the opportunity to, to train in this as a specific area and not just take what they have done in a brick and mortar situation into a distance one. Another question from the um, part of the audience today. Um, Nikki says she's delighted to see the important research, keen to understand whether or not there was surprises in the emerging findings and did it include aspects that might suggest our national health ecosystem would be improving its health? I'm not sure what they mean by improving its health. So Nikki, if you want to drop in the chat a little bit of clarity there, I can, I'll can. i tackle the first part, uh, including surprises. Um, I guess for me, because based on my own experiences, I had been primarily involved with uh, the distance learning school uh, with Takura, as well as the nonprofit programs that were out there. Uh, I was a little surprised to see the number of private schools that were there. A couple of them I had known about simply because they had come up in the news uh, from time to time, um, particularly, you know, in, in the early post-COVID or early COVID period, if you will. Um, but just the, there were a lot more there than I was anticipating. Uh, the other thing that surprised me a little bit about that uh, was the the fact that so many of those programs were using not just an independent learning model, but in many cases they were using, uh, I think of the, uh, if I remember it was five or six of the eight had an independent learning model, and of those over half of them were using um, a the Accelerated Christian Education Program out of the U.S., uh, which is known to be quite a... Um, 
a, a, a racist, sexist kind of curriculum that's really designed for a, a very Old Testament uh, fundamentalist view of the world. Um, so the fact that we had, um, you know, the majority of those private schools that were using that independent learning model, using that one particular curriculum was a, a bit surprising uh, to me. Um, I'll let Derek chime in while I dissect Nikki's um, follow up. Yeah, I was just um, looking at uh, the, the thing that came in from Cherie um, about the CAEs. Uh, I think that question is really pertinent to what we're talking about here, Shuri, in terms of the the points about agency, about choice, and also about inclusion, um, that potentially distance education or these alternative forms provide uh, a, a really unique and, and powerful way of providing for the needs of students, such as the example you gave, if they're properly designed, well managed, and so forth, and coming back to what um, Hagley are doing for their students, who are specifically those um, you know who who can't participate in the in the traditional ways, if the students you're talking about who try and try, often they are not receiving the level of additional support and coaching and looking at things in different ways to to get them to the point where they may pass those. So I think. It's a whole field that we haven't looked at specifically in this area, but it has highlighted uh, fields like this that need to be explored further. And one other point I'll just make on the, the issue around uh, ITE that Katrina raised. I think having spent more than 10 years in ITE, um, I wouldn't argue that ITE needs a bit of an overhaul and we need to look afresh at what we're doing, but I think it's it's not appropriate to lay the entire blame or need or opportunity here on ITE because I think this is and Michael raised this point earlier it, it's this is a continuing professional development thing our field is constantly um, developing and new skills are being required and we need to as part of our ecosystem be looking how we provide that and require it and maintain and sustain it in a way that that people are constantly being refreshed in their professional practice yeah, to pick up on that, um, you know, I noticed that, uh, and I guess just to add to one little point on the the ITE thing, I noticed that the the New Zealand initiative, um, in their latest newsletter um, that came out, I guess about four days ago, uh, the first article in, in that particular piece focused upon uh, a need to refresh, uh, you know, initial teacher education and and some of the ideas they were presenting, and I mentioned that. Uh, just so folks can look it up, because it seems like that particular group um, does have the ear of government right now. So being familiar with what they're uh, talking about and proposing might be useful. Um, to get Nikki's, the second part of Nikki's questions, as she added a bit of clarification for me, um, I think some of the things that we saw in the data did in, in did suggest that um, the health of the system is improving. Um, one of the main things I think that has changed, for example, from the this particular study, say compared to the one that I would have done back in 2011, um, is that at least on the program level, so the nonprofit program level, and those are you know mainly the programs of the the virtual learning network um, clusters. There's far fewer of them now, uh, which means that the expertise that we have around the administration of those programs, as well as their ability to provide professional development and mentoring to their teachers increases because, um, there's just, um, you know, the folks that are involved now are really some of the core folks. Whereas when there were say 20 programs or 18 programs, the fact that the, that leadership was much more diffused, uh, the expertise that existed at that top level that was supposed to filter down varied. Some of them, you know, were, you know, incredibly strong and others not so much. And as those programs sort of consolidated and amalgamated, um, the folks that were, you know, left behind in terms of those leadership levels levels, I think, uh, we're really in a much better position to essentially transmit the, the, the knowledge that had been learned over decades of offering these programs as to things that did work and things that might be more challenging uh, as they're providing distance learning uh, in these mediums. 
Um, so I, I think that's one of the things that we noticed uh, in this particular study that I, I think has really improved um, the health of the system. Can I pick up an innovation question, Michael, Derek? The, the whole idea of just lifting and shifting traditional content into a digital platform is no different than taking a hard copy pamphlet and suddenly making it a PDF and throwing it on a website. That's not actually innovation in its true sense. And when we think about innovation and that third PO on that list you had, where do we see and how do we encourage? Because teachers are incredibly at the pump at the moment and there is a significant digital education uplift. And I see Rachel and others have referenced the kind of digital education for teachers at UC and at um, Academy X. But, but where do we start to really think through what is it that we can teach and take advantage of the technology as the actual creator and enabler of the content coming to life, rather than it just being merely a platform on which content is served? Well, I think the, my, my response there would be, and Michael and I have talked a little bit about this, I mean, we, we really need I don't know, for lack of a better term, a think tank that's generating and pulling together this. I mean, it's it's great. Michael and I have been able to do this research. It's been limited in scope just by <laughs> it could have gone on forever and ever. We know we're tapping into expertise. Many people on this call are people with the sorts of expertise that could contribute really capably to this. But to do so with a really open agenda for what, what's ahead, because if, if you take, for example, just thinking about content, uh, the role potentially of AI into the future as a, as a, a way of um, not only kind of uh, creating or, or, or you know, providing content, but also personalizing it and bringing it there. And we see, you know, if you look in Western Australia, if you look into the UK, both of those jurisdictions have just announced within the last few weeks, you know, major, uh, um, initiatives to really deeply explore what this can do, what it enables, what the outcomes might be. Um, these are the sorts of initiatives that, certainly speaking personally, I would like to see advocated for and undertaken, not because we're saying it's it's the best thing since sliced bread and we're, we're wanting to put it in place forever and a day, but because we deeply need to understand and examine these things first. I'd also suggest that, you know, some of the, I mean, what you're really getting to is the idea that, you know, a distance education or these learning platforms or what have you are just a medium in, in the same way yeah. that, you know, um, the classroom is a medium and differences in learning, the way in which we impact learning are, are how we leverage that medium and, and take advantages advantage of the affordances that the medium provides while at the same time trying to account for or overcome the challenges that the medium provides. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, the, the biggest areas that not just in, in an education system in general, but to be perfectly honest, what folks who are directly engaged in distance learning um, could do a better job with. Um, unfortunately, as an example, um, there is this perception that asynchronous online learning and independent online learning are pretty much the same thing. They assume that, you know, that in both cases, it's just content thrown online and the student is supposed to work their way through it, you know, but asynchronous instruction is actually different than independent online learning. You know, independent online learning is, is that I'm going to send you the material regardless of how I give it to you, and I'm going to expect you to do it on your own. Asynchronous instruction involves an active teacher who is actually working the student through the material and supporting them along the way and designing purposeful interactions and activities for the student along the way. But yet most of the folks in, in our distance learning perspective, when they look at Takura as an example, they basically, you know, see the old correspondence model that's there and they don't see that as actually teaching. That's they're providing them with content and expecting the student to learn, which is not actually what's happening in most cases. I mean, yes, I'm sure there are teachers in Takura that are doing that in much the same way. I'm sure there's classroom based teachers that phone it in and do a lot of that as well. Um, you know, but I'm not sure phone it in is a, an expression that that translates over into the Kiwi environment, but hopefully so. 
Um, you know, so I, I think that's really when we're looking at these, this type of aspect, it's that idea of how do we purposefully design and deliver and support the learning through whatever medium that is being delivered yeah. so that students have a way to have success. And the only way in order to do that is to, you know, look at what the medium affords because different mediums allow us to do things easier. Um, there are also some challenges with certain mediums, and it's not just that, you know, the medium that's closest to face to face is the one that affords the most. Um, you know, if, if I I use a discussion as an example all the time, you know, this discussion here and, you know, what's happening in the chat and stuff, this represents, you know, a first blush at things. We're getting these questions as they're happening. We're thinking on our feet based upon it. And the responses that we provide right now would be very different than if we got all of these questions a week ago and we're able to go through and think about what had happened. That's the very, you know, that's a, a great example of the difference between an asynchronous discussion versus a synchronous discussion. And each one of them has different, you know, affordances and limitations to them. So how do we design the specific activity or what we're hoping the students will get out of it to maximize one and minimize the other? Derek, um, next question. Up. Sorry, I'm going to address to you is because it's been hanging a while and you've probably got the local knowledge that Michael won't have. But um, during COVID, Viv was actively involved in supporting schools as part of her role um, during that whole um, lockdown period. And she just asked whether or not there were examples of um, standard schools in New Zealand that are actually utilising that distance learning approach because after the COVID lockdowns, the schools that actually were doing really well um, actually, the teachers, the Kayako, felt excited and they reflected on how enjoyable it had been. So do we have those pockets of exemplars and how do we leverage those? It's, it's a good question. And I'd, I'd point again to the link that I put to the COVID research that I put up there because a lot of those um, examples are mentioned in that research or referenced in the papers that were done. Um, but I, I would highlight and reinforce, I guess, some of the key things. That, firstly, um, it, it's not always helpful to, to, to refer to those as being distance education examples. They were emergency remote responses. But from that, there are some principles that translate into what might be able to be built on for a more sustainable approach. Um, and really, you kind of get away from what emerged from our own research, you know, around agency and choice, where students were told to sit in uniform at period by period for a synchronous exchange with teachers, it wasn't very successful. But where students came from environments that already had been using, for instance, digital devices, they had online uh, connection with their learning, they were used to being uh, learning from home in a sort of flipped classroom environment, where that was an established practice and where the sorts of things that Michael was just talking about in terms of the teacher behaviour, the teacher role becoming one of being much more facilitative, coaching, my, guiding, me, all that, where those things were in place, then the students had a much better experience during COVID and an experience that is the sort of thing that we should be looking at, at creating the opportunity to scale and sustain um, in, in what we're talking about now. If you've got any other questions, please do add them to the Q&A. It's good to see them flowing through. Just thinking yeah, actually, about... If I could jump in on that, Jane, sure. while we're waiting for more questions. Um, I just looking for it in the chat there, but I know Rachel mentioned when we were talking about uh, COVID earlier, that um, I can't find the, the specific chat, but she mentioned about how the, the schools that were participating with the uh, Kotuiako and some of the other virtual learning network programs, um, you know, seemed to fare a little bit better during COVID than, than traditional schools. And, and in all honesty, I, I, I agree with her 100% there, um, particularly those that have been doing it for a long period of time and those who were using it more extensively for the exact reasons that Derek just mentioned. You know, they, that teacher mindset uh, 
that was there, they understood this notion of how these tools could be used and, and the uh, mix between, you know, the synchronous instruction that was provided, but then also having asynchronous time to, to work through activities that were in, in Google Classroom or in Moodle or whatever environment that they were using. Um, so because they already had that experience and, and they were used to it and many of their students had direct experience with this already, um, those programs had that, if you will, that schema of something that this is what it could look like or what it should look like, uh, as opposed to those schools that didn't have any experience in that environment or their only experience was either face to face or the more traditional correspondence school, which they still saw as basically independent learning. Um, you know, so you saw either you know, this 100% synchronous model or this 100% independent learning model or some combination of those two extremes without really that, you know, nice middle ground that a lot of those uh, schools that had participated in the virtual learn or one of the virtual learning network clusters in the past had. And I don't know if we've got, I think we've got a couple of new questions while I was rambling. I, I just, there was just a question from Viv I was going to respond to quickly um, that, um, that whole issue Viv, around redefining the word distance that's been a conversation for the last 20 years in the in the distance community and you'll notice that you know the distance education association of new zealand changed its whole approach 10 years ago and is now the flexible learning association new zealand and if you look more globally i mean it, it the, the general term seems to be odfl you know open distance and flexible learning um as a as a way of embracing this, this broader concept than just simply the separation by geography. Picking up on a comment you made earlier, um, Derek, around Western Australia and the UK having recently launched information around AI integrated, um, who's actually doing flexible learning globally really well? Did you see, um, I know this is exploring distance education in New Zealand, but is there some good global exemplars that we can look to and learn from? I think Michael's got a, a more hands-on um, connection with some of those things. I mean, there are numerous examples, aren't there, Michael? Yeah, although I, I'll be honest and say I, I don't think there's any one place that's doing it overall really well. I think yeah. there's a lot of individual examples that, like, if we were to take this from this group and this from this group, um, like, as an example, um, British Columbia, uh, was, uh, you know, when you, I look at that idea of how do we fund these programs, um, you know, British Columbia had a funding model where essentially the funding for whatever piece of education the, uh, the student was taking was given to the provider who was actually doing that. And then they also had a separate block that they provided to the place, the physical place where the student was residing. So if you had a student, for example, that was doing four courses this term, two of them from their school, one of them from distance learning provider A and another one from distance learning provider B, what ended up happening was that the school got half of the, the, the FTE, distance learning provider A got 25%, distance learning provider B got 25%, and then the school also got a block of funding to support the student while they were engaged in distance learning because the students still had to be in the building. They still had to be, you know, supervised in that in loco parentis model. They were still using a computer. They were still draining electricity out of the building and, and you know, they were still heating the room and all that kind of stuff. So the school still bore some costs, even though they weren't providing the learning, but it wasn't the full cost that they would if they were the provider. Um, so, you know, and, and there's been other jurisdictions that have looked at different models similar to that. Um, Florida used to have a model similar to that. Uh, Newfoundland had a model that was somewhat like it, although they were actually providing a resource teacher at the school based upon a proportional level on the number of students that were there for that. Um, so there's a lot of good isolated examples um, for that. Um, I noticed a couple of comments throughout the, the chat about, you know, uh, uh, attrition and retention issues. Um, you know, getting back to the, 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 the funding aspect, Arizona had a proposal that was never implemented that essentially would have funded uh, providers of education. Now, they only focused upon distance providers, but I think that this is a good model for all providers, both in-person and distance. 
um, where essentially you got a proportion of the funding up front when the student enrolled. When the student completed a certain amount of the course, say half of the course, you got another bit of funding for that student. Uh, and then when the student actually completed the course, they got another bit. And in the case of Arizona, they actually had a final bit that was put in for the student when they actually took the statewide assessment for that course. Um, this was back in the, the No Child Left Behind days where they had standardized testing for everything. So it was a way of encouraging programs to make sure students actually did the test. But how do we chunk up the funding so that, you know, we actually make uh, student completion tied to at least some proportion of the funding. And I say some proportion because you wouldn't want to do it with all of it because then uh, providers would only focus upon the students that they knew would complete. You know, but if you gave them some sort of incentive to provide support along the way, um, you know, uh, I, I could go on and on about different examples. You know, Ireland has a wonderful uh, program that that focuses up on um, students that have dropped out of the, the, the formalized system with their iSchool model. Um, there's a program in Michigan that focuses upon students who are in the juvenile justice system. Um, you know, so dependent, I think there's a lot of things we could pull in, uh, but there's no one jurisdiction that we can say, yeah, if we, you know, followed what they're doing, uh, we'd be in good stead. I, I think it's really a, a, a sort of a buffet of models we want to borrow from. I'd like to add to that, though, and pick up a little conversation that's been going on the side here. Because I, I, I don't disagree, it's it's always good to be looking afar and, and drawing from the experience of others. But it is interesting that here in New Zealand, we've had the VLN operating for over 30 years now. Um, and that, that the framework of that model has remained relatively intact right through that 30 years and been sustained by new people coming in and picking it up and so forth. And as, you know, um, Rachel's drawn attention to the Welsh are now uh, using that same approach and what they're doing. Michael talked about um, British Columbia. Back in 2003, I visited British Columbia where they were looking at the establishment of that model and exchanged the ideas of what we were doing with VLN, with what they were doing that contributed. And, and even now in Queensland, they have been they're looking at what we are doing here in New Zealand as uh, to inform what they are designing uh, downstream there. So we, we, we're we pretty bad at learning from our own experience and, and understanding. There have been numerous papers and submissions written based on our own New Zealand experience to try and um, uh, uh, you know get the sorts of changes to some of that policy legislative approach, as well as to areas like teacher education and the other things that we're mentioning that, that we could really do with having a raised voice, I think. One example of that, you know, that was something we recommended back in, in 2011 when I was working, when I first began working with Derek, we called for the, 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 the government through the Ministry of Education or some other agency to create a, a, an open education repository of online content that could be made available, not just to distance providers, but to brick and mortar providers as well, to encourage more blended and hybrid learning. Um, if you think about it, I mean, right now, Takura has this wealth of content that they've developed. And because they're a publicly funded agency, in theory, that's you know content that's been funded by the public dollar. Yeah. that right now Takura has access to and no one else has access to. Um, not saying that they're holding on to it, because in all honesty, I think if systems were in place to allow them to share it more easily, I think they'd be happy to do so. Um, but, you know, that's something that literally 13 years ago we call the actually the report it came out in was funded by the ministry itself. And yet 13 years later, the exact same problem still exists. And it was based upon a model that we uh, highlighted from the Canadian province of Ontario that they had been doing at that stage for over a decade. And, you know, so here we are now uh, two and a half decades later from when they first started it, a decade and a half from we first recommended it, and the exact same problem existed and, uh, you know, still exists. Which is a lovely segue into the sort of last 10 minutes or so about so what? Um, how do we actually now look at the opportunity this gives us from a systems and a policy perspective? 
um, primarily because it has been two decades since that 2013 report. There is exemplars of other jurisdictions using us as a best practice exemplar, and we don't seem to be able to do it ourselves in the way that would give all our learners equitable access and provide our teachers with additional skills to empower them to be able to teach in this way. So what do we need to do to actually turn this into something actionable? What do we need to do to actually make this come to life? Anyone? I think um, I'll give Michael a chance to think because he's got some excellent ideas on this. But I will say, um, for me, it comes back to the notion of systemness. Right now, more than ever, we need a, a system level voice, a, a unified voice uh, that gives expression to the sorts of things we've been talking about in this call uh, and can articulate that and convey that in, in ways that will have significance in across the sector. Because it's very easy to point the finger at the ministry and blame them for the lack of motion and movement in terms of policy and all that sort of thing. And I, for one, have been doing that a lot. Um, but we also need to recognise that part, another part of the puzzle is the, is the teaching profession itself. And, and the preparedness to embrace or adopt and, and engage with these changes. And then beyond that, the communities that they serve. This is something that needs quite a, a, an effective kind of comms strategy. Uh, and as we saw in the response to uh, Hagley's initiative, you know, it's become quite polarised in some areas with people speaking up who, who want a 1950s education system to continue um, and don't see any point in changing uh, alongside those who do. So I think a system view, and so that what that means is for individual providers uh, as well as individual schools who are starting to do this sort of thing, uh, is to move beyond simply thinking about their own activity and their own survival to thinking about uh, what we could achieve if we really had the system that we desired. That's where I'd be putting my energy. Yeah, I think Derek hits the nail on the head when he talks about this idea of a systems view. Like one of the difficulties I think we've had historically is that for the most part, either A, what was happening in these programs was either A, misunderstood or B, presumed to be just, you know, a couple of students that were doing these kinds of things. Um, you know, so if you think about, uh, you know, the virtual learning network, even w when we were doing that research, you know, 15 or 13 years ago, you know, we were talking about one and two percent of the students across the country at most um you know and even if you look at the work that you know the the 2023 report if we were to just focus upon those nonprofit programs and exclude you know those larger providers like the health schools uh like takura we're still only talking about you know one out of every hundred one out of every 200 students but as a group when you look at it i mean we're talking about almost 10% of the, the student population now that will take one or more courses each year at a distance. You know, it's one out of every 10 students. Um, you know, that's not something we could have said uh, a decade ago. Um, you know, so when we look at, as Derek talked about, that comm strategy, I think that's part of what we've, we've got to start talking about. Um, you know, the fact that this isn't just, you know, a small group of students on the margin that we're looking at, the, you know, those rural and, and remote students that only make up a minority of, you know, a, you know, this, this little piddling of a group. You know, this is a significant pot, you know, percentage of the population of students that we have in our system. Um, the other thing that I, I think we need to look at, and, and Derek is right in saying, you know, it's not just the ministry and it's not just governments because we've seen, you know, just in the past, well, since we, we did that 2011 report, you know, we've seen a national government that tried to do something with cools that didn't happen. We saw, you know, a labor government that came in that looked at, you know, trying to revise that and incorporate it into a larger digital learning strategy that never happened. You know, now we're back again with the national folks and, you know, so it's different political parties have, you know, really been paralyzed by this, if you will. Um, you know, different leadership within the ministries have done it. 
Um, the reality is, you know, as Derek mentioned, you know, the preparation of our teachers um, really hasn't changed all that much since we first started looking at this. Uh, the fact that most teacher education programs don't even have a, a basic technology integration course as part of their required components, which has been a staple in the United States since the 1980s, um, you know, is just something I think that is, you know, so there's a lot of there's systematic change that needs to happen, um, you know, both at a, a technical level, an infrastructure level, a policy level, and just the, the way in which we prepare folks to go into the system. Um, you know, the, the other thing that, that I would say as we look at, you know, what we're doing next, I think one of the things that we have been lacking uh, is really an understanding of what actually is happening. Um, you know, those who are directly involved can tell you, you know, this is what, you know, my, you know, my particular provider is doing, or this is the provider that I'm accessing courses from, this is what they're doing. Uh, we really haven't had that sort of national scope that looks at, you know, this is what's happening across the system. And there's a lot of different variations of what it looks like, both in terms of from an administrative structure, uh, from a legal or governance structure and in terms of the type of learning that they're providing. Um, you know, it, it looks very different. Um, you know, so having some better understanding of that, I think, gives us a, a starting point to have some of these conversations that we really haven't had in the past. Because, you know, if you would go and talk to some politician or some uh, ministry official or some stakeholder, their vision of what distance learning was, was based upon the one program that they had the most experience with and that's it. And they thought they all looked like that. Um, whereas I think this work really uh, does provide that nuanced perspective of what the field looks like. Thank you, Michael. Any last questions pop into the q and I think one of the, one of the things I'm hearing is, um, there's a lot of incredibly good work going on already in pockets across the country, and we need to start to, to build off Derek's idea of a, a think tank and advocacy um, element around what's actually taking place and what's working, because often you speak with people and they can only reference their known experience. And if their known experience is older or if they are um not necessarily up to date with what's happening in the classroom, let alone what's happening with distance learning. That then colours their view of the world. So um, it would be really good to think about how we can activate that concept of a think tank, bring people together. Derek can actually take this to the next um, the next level of conversation because we do need to think about how we can bring about change because two decades of not acting on the last report and having identified some possibilities is is not the best thing for our learners and certainly not addressing the equity issues that we all know exist in the education system. Um, if there are no further questions, I am going to thank both of you. Do you have any final comments before we um, close out? I'll just, I'll just add one. Rachel's put some notes in the comments there about the figures that Michael was talking about, which show a substantive increase overall in those who are involved in these programs. Um, my perspective on this uh, picks up on something that Michael said earlier around, um, you know, making content available to every learner. I think we need to be moving to a place where we see the, the, the division between what is distance and what's uh, in-person brick and mortar just go, that mm. it's, it's it creates what I argued uh, a couple of years ago is the essence of hybrid. It's that ability to move seamlessly between those environments as the need is required. Um, and, you know, to me, that's built up in the notion of system resilience, mm -hmm. that actually if we had a system like that and we had the sorts of things that Michael and I have both been outlining, we would be in a position where when it when it strikes an individual who can no longer attend or whether it's a whole community who get flooded out or a whole nation who go into lockdown because of COVID, we have a resilience to be able to continue operating as a system.
I guess just to pick up on that, you know, Derek mentioned, you know, the idea of the things that are going to prevent us from basically walking into a school building in the future. And and the reality is, is that we are going to face more and more of that. Yeah. Um, so those nations that are able to to figure this out so that they don't have another COVID like experience where you have, you know, teachers and parents and students that really have no idea of how to learn outside of the four brick and, you know, the four walls of their brick and mortar school. You know, those systems that are those nations that are able those jurisdictions, I should say, that are able to figure out that are going to be the ones that are going to have success going forward. Um, you know, because the rea I remember, and I tell this story often, um, during the first days of the pandemic, my university, because it's a primarily a medical school, we're doing these webinars for the public about what we were, what we knew. And in the very first one, the, the guy who founded our public health program uh, was one of the, you know, eight minute presenters in this hour long slot. And he had a slide up there and, and you know, that looked at, you know, past pandemics. And his comment was that if you look through recorded history, on average, there are two to three pandemics every century, um, you know, these global pandemics or large regional pandemics. Um, since 2000, COVID was the fifth major pandemic that we have experienced. And we were only a fifth of the way through this century, All right? So statistically speaking, in his mind, that there was another 20 of these to come at some point in the next 80 years. Um, you know, now, do, I don't know how you'd classify monkeypox as being one of those, but that might mean that there's 19 left to come, you know, in the next 77, or I guess 76 years that we've got left in this century, not to count, you know, all of the, you know, the expanding impacts of, of climate change that were happening. So, you know, this isn't just change to be, you know, for the sake of change or change to be innovative. This is change that is going to be born out of necessity um, as we look at what is impacting our world today. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Michael and Derek, for a really interesting and um, challenging, but also um, opportunistic mm -hmm. opportunities for us in this space. And I also thank everyone who joined us today. Um, as is the case, our EPIT website has our events and other information and reports which make them available uh, for people to go and have a look at. And I will just close this out with a cavic here, but thank you for tuning in and do join us again on the other webinars that we host. Kua mutu a matu mahi mō tēnei wā, manakitia mai mato katoa, o mato hoa, o mato whanau, aio ke te arangi. Thank you and um, have a great day, everyone.